Hello, Goy, bonjour. Welcome to the Ottawa Art Gallery. Uh, my name is Rochelle Dickinson, and I am the new, shiny, bright, new senior curator at the Ottawa Art Gallery, and I'm really excited to see all of you in real life. It's lovely. Not to uh, forget the folks on Zoom, too. Thanks for watching, but I can't see you. Um, that's okay, it's about Heather Igloliorte tonight. Uh, the OAG is located on um, Anishinaabe Aki, and we look forward to continuing to build respectful relations with Algonquin uh, Anishinaabe nations through, uh, through the arts, through policy, through administration, and um, it's an ongoing process that we're excited about and committed to here at the OAG, um, specifically because it's about relationship building, and that is really enriching and that's what makes for good public programming and ethical public programming and um it's it's just really exciting some of the stuff that we've got coming up that i can't tell you about because it's not about us so i have to keep reminding myself of that you're all here tonight to uh join us for a conversation with dr heather Egloliarte, who i'm very excited to introduce i haven't seen her in a long time um, Dr. Igloliarte is a Tier 1 University Research Chair Circumpolar Indigenous Arts at uh, Concordia University. She is also the Special Advisor to the Provost, Advancing Indigenous Knowledges, and an Associate Professor at the Department of Art History, among so many other things. Um, just as a little side note, uh, Heather has moderated a conversation as part of an Inuit Futures in Arts Leadership Partnership with the Ottawa Art Gallery, the conversation she's moderated is between artists Leslie Reed and Robert Kotek, and it is in the context of a forthcoming exhibition called Dark Ice that will open in April around the 22nd, I believe. Um, so stay tuned for, uh, to the website for um, online viewing of that conversation. Checking to make sure Heather knows. Awesome. I love it when that happens. Um, it's also really nice to gather together to celebrate the enriching and growing relationships between Algonquin Anishinaabe nations, Carleton University, the Ottawa Art Gallery, and the University of Ottawa. And we have representatives from each group here tonight, which is lovely. Um, this event is sponsored by the School of Studies in Art and Culture at Carleton University, the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Ottawa, the Ottawa Art Gallery, and the Carleton University Art Gallery. Our conversation here will take place in English. Um, in addition to that, however, during the Q&A, if you have a question that you'd like to pose in French, Marianne Brown, who is a uh, MA student at the University of Ottawa and an intern here at the Ottawa Art Gallery and co-curator extraordinaire, will be translating your questions for Heather in the, during the Q&A. We're also honored here. Um, that Elder and University of Ottawa Professor Claudette Commanda, Algonquin Anishinaabe from Kitigan ZB, Anishinaabe First Nations has agreed to open our event and I'll introduce her more fully in a few moments. Dr. Carmen Robertson is Canada Research Chair in North American Art and Material Culture in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, jointly appointed between the School of Canadian Art and Culture, the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies and the Institute for Comparative Studies in literature, art, and culture at Carleton University. And Carmen will be introducing Heather Igloliarte, and will also be speaking a bit more, giving a bit of context about the Shirley Thompson lecture series. Um, another side note, we have in the shop, uh, Diana Nemiroff's book, Women at the Helm, how Jean Sutherland Boggs, uh, Shio Yen Shin, and Shirley L. Thompson changed the National Gallery of Canada. It's available in the Annex Bookshop for purchase if you want to have a look at that. Our program today will be about an hour followed by a Q&A. And uh, for those of you joining us on Zoom, do please ensure that your microphones are off. This event will be recorded. And so make yourself comfortable if you have to get up and exit and come back, it's totally fine. It's, uh, it's just really nice to get together and visit. So thank you. It is my great pleasure now to introduce Elder Claudette Commanda, Algonquin uh, Anishinaabe from Kitigan Zibi, 
Um, Elder Commanda is a University of Ottawa alumni, having graduated from the Faculty of Arts, Faculty of Law, Common Law section. She was inducted into the Common Law Honor Society in 2009. A devoted and inspiring mentor, Elder Commanda has taught at the University of Ottawa's Institute of Women's Studies, Faculty of Law, Faculty of Education, and the Aboriginal Studies Program, teaching courses on First Nations women, Native education, First Nations people in history, Indigenous traditions, and decolonization. Elder Commanda has a long relationship between, with the arts in this city that is incredibly rich and fruitful. Uh, and uh, personally for me, I've noticed and really appreciated the way that she connects the arts with indigenous rights and sovereignty and really raises the points of the fact that they're interconnected and absolutely crucial for each other. Um, and we have responsibility in institutions like this one and in universities to honor those relationships and lift them up. So Elder Commanda, if you would mind joining me up front here, we are very grateful to you. Chi miigwech. <laughs> the long walk. That's okay, that's my exercise of the day. <laughs> Greetings to everyone. Are we not all happy to be here? First, let us raise our hands. Let us raise our hands in appreciation and gratitude uh, for Dr. Igliorti, who is here to share with, I will say the world, of our people and those practices. So let us. I also want us to raise our hands in appreciation for the Ottawa Art Gallery and those who lead this gallery. Let us give that appreciation because you kept it going, you kept it together, especially during these two years that we all were impacted because of this pandemic your community of artists, of creators. You kept us going. You gave us that inspiration and that hope. You supported, you supported the artists. You supported the knowledge and the wisdom. You provided that space. So I wanna raise my hands and all of us in this circle are going to show that Whether we are from the various First Nations or the Inui or the Métis, our ways of knowing and our ways of doing, it is a responsibility that we ensure that there will be a tomorrow for the children of today and the children that will come in seven generations. That is so important. New ways forward. At the same time, ensuring that those ancestral sacred ways are never forgotten. It is a time in this country that Canadians and the world at large are turning to Indigenous peoples. They're seeking our support to heal this country. And I'm a firm believer that it is through the creativity, it is through the heart world that healing will come. Because when we create when our artists create, 
no matter what form of, of a gift that they have in this art, it is healing because it is the essence of the spirit of the individual whom he or she carries their ancestors here today and tomorrow. So I thank you, each and every one of you artists who have shared your spirit, who have shared your knowledge, who have shared your voice, who have shared your creativity. I thank you for what you've shared with us. And we welcome each and every one of you to this beautiful territory. I acknowledge the homelands of all indigenous peoples from coast to coast to coast. I acknowledge my ancestors, our ancestors whom we refer to as Nijen Wen Daganago Mama Weniniwag, those first ancestors of this land. And I acknowledge each and every one of you, your ancestors. To you, my Inuit relatives, I acknowledge your ancestors. To you, the Métis relatives, I acknowledge your ancestors. And to you, Canadians, no matter where you have come from, to come here and settle on this land called Canada, I acknowledge your ancestors. We must never forget who we are. We must never forget our ancestors, but for our ancestors, we would not be here today. I stand here before you to give these words a blessing because of my ancestors and to follow that responsibility. You have, you have acknowledged the land that you are on. We have welcomed you to this land that you are on. And it is said when we come together, we put our mind, our heart, our spirit, our voice as one to give honor to that creator, that one who has given to all. And we say, we come together, Creator, as brothers and sisters in this circle. We put our hearts, our spirit, and our voice together as one, and we thank you, Creator, for all of your blessings. As we acknowledge our little sister who is here today, Ether, who will share her knowledge of her people. Together, Creator, we acknowledge that first mother, our mother, the earth, as we acknowledge that first grandmother, our grandmother, the moon, as we acknowledge that first grandfather, our grandfather, the sun, as we acknowledge all those relatives from the four directions, as we acknowledge all of life that you have blessed us with. And it is so important that we remind ourselves, we, we remind others, the importance of always remembering those first grandparents, those first mother, who's blessed us each and every day. As we acknowledge our relatives who are in the spirit world, for they continue to guide us. And creator, my heart and my spirit and my voice, I ask you creator, to bless each and every person who is here with that strength, with love, with courage, and that good life. And we are all here this evening to learn new ways forward. This is so important. It is education. It is said in our beliefs, every day of our life is education. And you have heard long life learning, that concept. From the moment we are born to the moment we leave this physical world, we are learning. We are learning and moving forward, but never forget the beauty of the sacredness of our ancestors and there's our ways of knowing and our ways of being. And it is said, and I believe that the greatest way or the greatest forms, or the greatest method of education is through art. Creativity, because it is of people, it is of spirit, it is of culture, it is of language. It is of those who have come before us, and it is of those who will come behind us. New ways of moving forward. The seven generations will come to move forward as we remember those sacred grandfathers 
that are here with us each and every day of our lives. That grandfather that we call wisdom, love, respect, honesty, humility, and truth. Artists speak their truth. And very important messages are in, the, in their creativity. Whether it's in a floral pattern or in, in a beadwork or in literature or in a song or dance. Powerful messages, powerful messages of whether it's politics or society or rights movement, it's always about the people. It's always about history, history of the past, history of today and history of tomorrow. But tonight, we're not gonna hear his story. We are going to hear her story. <laughs> So Chimi Gwajather Kibijaya Goma Nongomai, thank you for being your other to share to everyone, with everyone, the knowledge that you carry of your people. Thank you. So to each and every one of you, just remember, we're so thankful that we are gathered here. So thankful. Keep up that good work in supporting art, supporting the artists. Keep up that good work because we truly need. We truly need the art world. It brings us inspiration. It brings us joy. It makes us just feel so happy, right? So happy. So chimi gwech nitchki wei dug a yang in nigawab min. No words for goodbye, but until we see each other again, you take good care. And the circle is here tonight. Very strong, very proud. And I want to say chimi gwech to each and every one of you for coming out here. And to you in, in Zoom land, you're part of this too. <laughs> so thank you so much. And, uh, and just remember, hope is free. And so is love. Kizagi and Nitschkiwedu. I love you, my friends. Miigwech. Thank you. Well, that's a very tough act to follow. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elder uh, Commander. That was uh, so inspiring. And um, before I introduce Heather, I just want to give you a few words of, uh, about the Shirley Thompson Lecture Series. Uh, it began in 2011 to honor the memory of Dr. Shirley Thompson, who was a leading force in the promotion of visual arts in Canada. Dr. Thompson was a companion of the Order of Canada and held many important cultural positions, including director of the National Gallery of Canada from 1987 to 1997, and director of the Canada Council for the Arts from 1998 to 2002. Her strong presence was also felt at the Department of Visual Arts uh, at University of Ottawa, where she served as an adjunct professor. I want to thank the organizing committee. I want to thank the OAG, uh, of course, uh, Elder Commanda, and uh, all of you for coming and giving us an opportunity to actually be together tonight. It's such a wonderful opportunity to visit. I'm honored this evening to introduce Dr. Heather Gloliarte, who will deliver the 2022 Shirley Thompson Memorial Lecture. An associate professor of art history and an independent curator, Heather is Inuk from Nunavutsiak and holds the Tier 1 Concordia University Research Chair in Circumpolar uh, Indigenous Arts. She also holds a Royal Canadian Academy of Arts medal awarded in 2021. Now these accomplishments make Heather an excellent choice for tonight's lecture to be sure, yet her titles alone cannot begin to explain the trailblazing and transformative force that she has evinced in the field of indigenous art history and curatorial practice. 
At a time when museums and galleries across Canada talk about change, Heather is actively making change on the arts landscape as both a curator and as a leader in the arts. Since completing her PhD at Carleton University in 2013, she's worked collaboratively to envision and forge future directions for Inuit art. Last summer, during a bit of a lull in the COVID rules, I found myself walking through Inua, the inaugural exhibition at Hamayork, the pivotal new Inuit art museum in Winnipeg that Heather will be talking about this evening. As the lead curator for Inua and the co-chair co of the Winnipeg Art Gallery's Indigenous Advisory Circle, I found uh, Heather's impact resonates throughout the, the spaces, the glass walls of the vault and the expansive exhibition space that uh, displays works of more than 90 Inuit artists. I thought back to when I first met Heather was at the Urban Shaman Gallery in Winnipeg back in the early 2000s when we were beginning a process to create the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective, which is now the Indigenous Curatorial Collective. So Winnipeg's a, a magnet for her. As the principal investigator of the Shirk Partnership Grant in Inuit Futures in Arts Leadership, Heather empowers circumpolar Indigenous peoples to become leaders in the arts. Uh, in this and in other key funded projects, Heather facilitates the dissemination of arts and ideas nationally and internationally, and she publishes frequently. She co-edited two special issues of journals, including RACAR's Continuities Between Eras, Indigenous Art in 2017. Her essay on Inuit knowledge in the Haluna Art Museum was awarded the 2017 Distinguished Article by Art Journal. And she co-edited Hamak uh, Kiria, oh, I'm sorry, I messed that up. Uh, Art, Culture and Sovereignty across Inuit, Nunat and uh, Sapmi, mobilizing the circumpolar north. Uh, with University of Toronto Press that will be available in June. And of course, everyone involved in Indigenous art histories is anxiously awaiting the forthcoming compendious publication she co-edited with Dr. Carla Taunton, the Rutledge Companion of Indigenous Art Histories in the United States and Canada. I could go on, but I think you all want to hear Heather. So Heather, thank you for accepting our invitation to deliver the 2022 Shirley Thompson Memorial Lecture. The, uh, uh, we're back, <laughs> we're back in person. And I, uh, I just wanna, I wanna start by thanking Elder Commander for that beautiful, beautiful introduction and for starting us off so well in such good minds and in a good headspace. I, you know, I, I um, met you, I think it was probably when I first moved here 17 years ago. And I remember attending talks like this where your father would give similarly beautiful openings. And it's just, it's incredible to be back again. Uh, I, I hope this is my first public lecture <laughs> in person. I've done lots of Zoom lectures, but my first public lecture uh, in a little over two years, I feel a little bit rusty. I was at an art opening last weekend and I'm not even gonna lie, an artist I hadn't seen in a while uh, put out his fist for a fist bump and I grabbed it and shook it. <laughs> and that there were witnesses that happened. So uh, I hope that this goes better than that did, <laughs> but. I've already broken the ice. Okay, <laughs> so unasakut. Uh, Dr. Heather Gluliukdu Vunga Tungatsugitsi. Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm so grateful to be here with you tonight in person and virtually for everyone who's tuning in. Uh, uh, I wanna acknowledge that this lecture takes place on Algonquin lands and I'm so grateful to be here. And uh, thank you, Elder Commander for that beautiful opening. Uh, I also want to thank Mitchell Frank, Carmen Robertson, and everyone at ICSLAC, uh, the program that I finished my PhD in, for inviting me here to speak and to give this memorial lecture, uh, the Ottawa Art Gallery for hosting, and Rochelle and Marianne for um, doing the moderating after the talk this evening. I'm, I'm very excited to get to talk to you in person. Um, I also want to acknowledge Sandra Dick, who was going to be here this evening in person, and now she might have a little bit of a cold, so she's joining us virtually as well. But I'd like to acknowledge Sandra because she um, 
uh, was the director or was the curator at the uh, Carleton University Art Gallery where I curated my first exhibition. So where this all began uh, back 17 years ago, which makes me, I know what you're thinking, how is it possible that she was working 17 years ago? She's such a baby. Um, <laughs> or maybe you're all thinking, oh my God, that was 17 years ago. I knew her back then. <laughs> um, <laughs> Tonight, I'm going to talk about the exhibition Inua that I worked on before and throughout the pandemic, which opened in March of 2021 at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, and share with you how this exhibition contributes to a broader project of training and mentoring Inuit into professional positions in the arts, uh, particularly into leadership positions. In this lecture, I'm going to draw on some of my recent writings on various aspects of that project and this project. Um, including the sort of larger scale projects. Some work has been recently published, some is about to be published. And on the insights and reflections of my co-curators, collaborators, mentors, and mentees, as we develop this exhibition together over several years. So I will begin as we do in the exhibition and as we always do with who I am and where I'm from. I'm an Inuk from Nunatsiavut, the most easterly region of Inuit Nunat. Uh, Inuit Nunat is all the yellow on this side map. This is just Wikipedia's map, but it's a great one to sort of show you all of the Inuit homelands around the circumpolar world. And we're on the sort of northeastern edge looking up at Greenland. Um, I am an Inuk from Nanatsiavut uh, and a Newfoundlander. I grew up in Happy Valley Goose Bay. My mother is a Newfoundlander and retired educator. My father, who is an Inuk, uh, is a residential school survivor who went on to be the first Inuit judge in Canada. His parents were Matthew Igloliorti and Susanna Mitsuk, and that's her on the right. She's, she was a very well-known seamstress. So that's where I, where I come from. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about the new wing Kamayuk of the Inuit Art of the new uh, Inuit Art Gallery, the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about uh, some of the aspects that I've given recent other lectures on, including about the Indigenous Advisory Circle and the naming processes that came to this. I want to focus on the exhibition for this lecture. In 2018, I was invited by the Winnipeg Art Gallery to curate the inaugural exhibition of Kamayuk. Shortly thereafter, I counterproposed the formation of an exhibition team spanning Inuit Nunanga, that's just the uh, parts inside of what we now call Canada, and representing a diversity of expertise and perspectives to make this a more collective project. This team therefore includes myself, an Inuk and Newfoundlander who is an academic, art historian, and curator from Nunatsiapu. Uh, next to me is Asinayak, a visual artist, filmmaker, writer, and curator from Nunavik. Uh, next to her is Krista uliuk zawadzki an anthropologist, archaeologist, curator, and researcher from Nunavut, who is a current but about to be graduate of the ICSAC program as well. And uh, next to her is Kablusiak. They are a multidisciplinary artist and curator from the Nubialuit Nunangit uh, Sanek uh, Tuak. As you might imagine, creating an exhibition for a building still under construction that most of the curators were unable to visit due to the, pan the constraining circumstances of a global pandemic was quite stressful <laughs> at times. Uh, it also required ongoing negotiation, flexibility, adaptability, and patience, for example, while opening dates were scheduled and rescheduled again and again, <laughs> parameters shifted, and the individuals involved were variously affected by the pandemic in direct and indirect ways. Uh, my role as the lead guest curator, I want to frame this, was not to lead the curatorial decisions of the project. I think it's really critical to say that um, the, the, my co-curators and I all brought very distinct and different uh, curatorial skills and knowledge and backgrounds and histories to the project. We really worked collaboratively on the creative aspect. As the senior curator on the project, I saw myself much more as the person who had to liaise with the institution and to be the person who was the go-between between the institution and to protect my co-curators from the sort of day-to-day -day, um, constraints of working with big institutions when you are Indigenous peoples who are guest faculty and so on. Uh, my colleague, Michelle, has written extensively around institutional activism. And I think that that is the role that I saw myself in for this position. Um, the, so the project was difficult because none of us had been in the building. I think there was, I'd been on one tour when it was basically just a big cavern before the pandemic began. And then of course, we were also working from architectural drawings made by Michael Molson, who's a 
uh, brilliant but Los Angeles based <laughs> art, uh, architect who has very little knowledge of Inuit art outside of his um, work on this particular project. And so <laughs> looking at these drawings, it's, it's very, very hard. And I do encourage you and hope that you get to go and see Kamayuk in person because the scale it really does not do justice to what uh, the institution is like. What you're looking at in these drawings is a floor plan that uh, makes up over uh, the squares footage of um, over two hockey rinks. <laughs> so to try to imagine to curate in that space without ever having bid it, I think is quite daunting. Uh, the exhibition that we did create, Inua, uh, is both an acronym and a, a way that we were framing the exhibition in our minds, a way of thinking through um, how we're moving forward. Inua, in, Inuit Nunangat Ungamaktut Atautikut, or Inuit Moving Forward Together, is the inaugural exhibition of the new building at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Installed throughout the galleries of Kilak and Gishik on the third and fourth floors of the new building and occupying over 8,000 square feet of gallery space, Inua features more than 100 works made by 91 artists in a vast array of media, styles, and materials. The title of the exhibition, conceived of by Maggie Putuluk, the mother of co-curator Krista uliuk Zawadzki, references the spirit or life force of all things, Inua, which permeates the works in the show and is also an acronym for our collaborative, collective, and forward-thinking approach to Inuit exhibition practices. The exhibition features our Inuit artists from throughout Inuit Nunat, including Kalali Nunat, that's Greenland, Inuit Nunangat, that's the four Inuit regions of Northern Canada, and Yupik and Inupiaq artists from across the Alaskan Native Territories as well. We invited participation from artists, including youth, straight through to elders, uh, emerging mid-career and senior artists. We paid careful attention to the balance of uh, sexuality and gender expressions, and considered a diversity of media that suggests the incredible depth and breadth of artistic production found throughout the Inuit circumpolar world. And here I'm doing that thing where I show you images and I don't tell you what you're looking at. <laughs> and so I'm going to pause for a moment and share just for a second. Um, you will see some of these images later. These are mostly installation shots, but this, for example, is the work by Zacharias Kunuk and the Asuma team, My Little Quarter of Canada, which is a recreation of his uh, hunting shack that we built inside of the gallery. And then on the inside, it is a four channel video projection or, or on four screen, sorry, a four channel video project that um, begins out on the land with an elder telling stories about the place that they are on and then moves into town and then into, uh, and I don't have a shot of it here, but into um, hearings about the local mining development. And so you move, you see very quickly uh, how critical it is that they think about how all the places on the land are, are tied to these places that are soon to be potentially under development. And so the artists in the show were thinking through a lot of these critical issues, and we wanted to highlight uh, a, a, a lot of the different kinds of concerns that artists and Inuit community members are feeling today. We borrowed from national and international institutions, commissioned 15 new works, and dug deep into the WAG and government of Nunavut collections currently housed at WAG Kamayok. In this way, Inua celebrates the history of Inuit art, interrogates contemporary art practices, and points to future directions all along one great continuum of Inuit artistic fluorescence. Throughout the exhibition, we grouped together works of great significance, celebrating, for example, the communities which have become famous for their ongoing collaborative productions, such as wall hanging and ceramics, or highlighting the continuity across Inuit Nunat of long-standing and widely shared practices, such as, hold on. Uh, I just really like all these pieces. <laughs> you could do, I often say you could do a really great show at the WAG of just uh, bugs, <laughs> things on bugs. I've just told you my idea, but I'm going to do it <laughs> at some point. Um, we also like in this installation brought together dolls that um, are also sort of like a map and go from uh, the Western to the Eastern part of the Arctic here highlighting um, this, this long history and continuity of practices that you can find around the circumpolar world. These installations reflect our diversity and collectivity and speak to the wealth of culture we and future generations inherit from our ancestors. There is a really stunning collection of nine uh, pieces of jewelry that we actually know very little about. These were, we believe were all created at the same workshop funded perhaps by the government of, well, not what the government of Nunavut, but the Northwest Territories government in the 1960s, uh, because they all have the same color green stone and use other similar materials, but we know very little besides who the artists are 
um, uh, who made these fantastic pieces. So we hope to, that the future will also include uh, more research and expansion on you know, initiatives that were undertaken decades ago. Our process and philosophy is distinct. Inua is grounded in Inuit methodologies of respect and care for our relationships through decision-making based on what serves the collective good rather than individual benefit. It started with a methodology of openness, welcoming, and inclusiveness. We agreed early on to foreground consensus-making in our decision-making process. This, of course, is not an example of consensus making, but us posing for the photographer who happened to be there at that time and we had to pretend. What we're actually looking at is that one of the works seemed to be sticking off the wall kind of funny and we were perplexed, but let's, let's um, suspend disbelief and pretend that we are collaborating here. Um, most, of those, most of those things took place over Zoom or around a boardroom, so they're less dynamic photos to look at. Um, We've made it our priority to respect the past, to think through the future, to be radically inclusive of Inuit gender and sexually diverse community, and to feature artworks in media that will surprise and provoke audiences. This was really critical to us. Uh, I'll just show you again, I'm gonna go through a few images here. This is um, from, I think our youngest emergency artist in the exhibition, Bronson Jacques, The Warm-Up Shack. This is a piece that reflects on um, <laughs> the, the uh, dual shacks, uh, warm-up shacks that he has in his family's community. This is the one that the hunting shack out on the land. And the other one is um, the hydro development site that he worked on where he his job was tending to the 24 uh, hour a day burning material fire. So it's like thinking about, I, uh, I thought, I said to Bronson at one point, I said, I feel like this work is a bit didactic. And he said, oh, I've toned it way down. It was so much worse than I am making it seem in this image right now. Um, there are other important histories and crises uh, and um, histories of colonization that we wanted to highlight throughout the exhibition. This is one of our uh, one of our commissioned works from Bill Nassa Galawak. And I here I'll quote my co-curator: "The history that made my uncle Bill Nassa Galawak share in his work W three twelve fifty eight is not part of our culture, but became part of our story." This work speaks to a chapter in the history of Canadian colonialism, wherein the government stripped Inuit of our names, replacing them instead with numbers. I would like to say kianini to my uncle for shedding light on this, as I've learned that many Canadians did not know about it. Um, this is an incredibly powerful piece that was installed in the context of other sculptural works in the exhibition uh, that are important to our history. Uh, our most senior commission was by Elder Fanny Avetituk, her untitled wall hanging speaks of artists' desires to help one another be good ancestors, my other co-curator, Krista Uliuk Zawadzki says. In 2021, Avetituk told me that her inspiration for this work came from her personal experiences of traveling south. She said she feels lost when she is out of her community and that she felt others, might, others must feel the same way when they are in a foreign place. She wanted to help people find their way home to Nunavut speaking to the way Inuit always want to ensure people have the skills to find their way. We thought this was a really beautiful piece and uh, really significant in the context of the historical works of wall hangings that were hung salon style in the gallery outside. Um, speaking about the theme of the exhibition, this is the opening of the exhibition. This is a really important space where we hold space for those who enter in. You can see that it's bright green, uh, it's sort of a sagey green. Um, and it, in very deep contrast to the rest of the very white gallery space that was outside. And this is one of those areas where I had to um, really make a passionate case to the administration about why we wanted to do this, because it was important to the institution that they keep the aesthetic that the architect had been working towards, which was an all white space for that opening exhibition. And um, as a curatorial team though, we really wanted to advocate to have color and vibrancy and um, flowers and evidence of teeming life in that opening space because we knew and we're conscious of the fact that we were on Treaty 1 territory, we're not in Inuit Nunanga, we were taking place in a Southern community and there's always the concern that we might perpetuate the idea that the Arctic is a big white vast space when you have a big white vast gallery. And so it was really critical to us to start with this kind of a holding space where it welcomed people in with this beautiful uh, Amauti by fashion designer based in Ottawa, Matakayak, and uh, the wall hangings, the four seasons of the tundra. And then on the left, um, works by one, uh, one, one or two works by each of our ancestors that were either in the collections or brought into the show. So from left to right or west to east, 
uh, dolls by Kabutziak's grandmother, a uh, sculpture by Krista's great grandfather, um, two more dolls by um, uh, a Sinayak's great aunt, and a caribou high purse by my grandmother. And so those two sort of pieces, those or those three pieces, really hold space for how you enter in and understand that this is a work that comes, that the project comes out of our ancestry and our knowledge and our connections going forward and moving back, as well as our connection to the land. This is just a indulge me to put up a close up of my grandmother's um, seal of caribou hide purse here. Uh, I'm just going to show you a few more images before I move on to, I'm going to move into a little bit about the mentorship project and how it relates to Inua and then how there's a broader project as well. So I'll just show you a few of the more works in the show. Uh, please know that I'm not showing you every single thing in the show <laughs> as much as I would like to. Um, the exhibition has been extended through 2023. So please go this fall if you can, or this summertime. We're really, really thrilled. Um, this is a work by... Uh, this is work very clearly dealing with ancestry. This is Maya Sialuk Jacobson and uh, images of her children and namesakes. This is uh, Glenn Gear, his work inside of a shipping container that was stalled in the gallery. You can see that we had the hunting shack, the shipping container, and I'll show you in a moment uh, Lindsay McIntyre's installation that kind of give you a sense of three potential interiors that you might experience in the Arctic. And we did that so that we could ground the exhibition and not just have a lot of little walls for the first installation. We wanted people to really appreciate the architecture of the building and to experience that kind of grandeur without having it taken away from uh, by the art inside, but to really have them complement each other. Uh, this is a, a sound and video installation that projects inside of a mural. On the left-hand side is an oral history and on the right-hand side, is um, a work that depicts Inuit futurism, including, you know, like a husky in a spacesuit flying in a jetpack. <laughs> so, um, this is Shirley Morehouse's work from Happy Valley Goose Bay, my community, to honor the fire keepers. This is a really stunning uh, beaded fire that she has in the center of the installation, talking about those artists who have been holding space for generations in, this, in the uh, space of environmental degradation and destruction, as Claudette was talking about earlier. Uh, Ningyo TV and other works from the collections that uh, were significant to us to include as both prints and prints drawings and sculpture from the latter half of the 20th century. Um, works that we thought were really important to the history of Inuit art that we wanted to share, like this piece by Michael Massey. This is a this it's it's not about this work in particular, but Michael Massey is the an artist who was working in metal in Inuit art in the 19 late 1980s and early 1990s. And he told me um, that or Mary Bell Mitchell, actually, the former editor of Inuit Art Quarterly, told me that um, when she published a little tiny photo in the bottom square of like a 1991 in Inuit Art Quarterly, it was just a little black and white image of a bowl that he had made that had Ulu's for the stands on the bowl and called Ulu Bowl. And she said that she'd never received so much hate mail. Uh, people were outraged that an Inuit artist would dare to work in a medium that was not an Inuit art medium. And so that was a big part for us of like also wanting this show to um, integrate and share and celebrate artists who have been uh, breaking boundaries for generations. It's Brian Adams from Alaska through a series of, it's, it's pulled from five or six different photo series. So I decided to, you can go to the website to see all the different series that this is a part of, but really, really wonderful photos. Uh, this is a work by Megan Kayak Monteith. There's actually two videos in this series. These are stop motion animation oil paintings, really, really beautiful technique that I, I think she created. I'm not sure, but it's, these are uh, really wonderful pieces. A poem by Greenlandic artist Jesse Kleeman, who's also a performance artist. This is actually one half of a uh, performance and poem that, that go together under Articosis Dreaming. And then this uh, quote from our, uh, our exhibition manager, uh, Jocelyn Perenin, who is also the only Inuk full-time museum staff person in the country right now and has been for a long time. So we were really, really thrilled to get to work with Jocelyn. The, her coming on board midway through our project really expanded our team in exciting new ways. And we've included her and all the other contributors in the catalog, which has just come out. Um, Jocelyn says, one of the works in Inua that explores similar ideas around an Inuk sense of belonging and one that I resonated the most deeply with 
is Lindsay McIntyre's multimedia installation, We Are All Different. For Inuit, five Inuit from different backgrounds are interviewed and their responses touch on their own experiences of being Inuk and lean into the notion that our individual histories and ways of being brought, to, brought up have shaped who we are today. The title of McIntyre's piece came up in conversation with Arviet Nooks, Lind, Arviet's Nooks Lindell, who noted that Inuit are everywhere now. Not all Inuit are in the North and not everybody in the North is Inuk, which is a sentiment that I relate to now having lived in Southern cities most of my life. Um, this is a really beautiful installation. It is a sound and video installation. I'm sorry that the, the still is from before the exhibition opened, but there is actually a stop motion video that Lindsay has made um, that plays in the background and then two different soundtracks that are hidden in the lamp and the radio, I guess, is not really hidden in the radio because soundtracks are supposed to come out of the radio, but there are two pieces and um, uh, that are in this kind of uh, recreation of her Anansiak's kitchen. And I, I put up this photo of the rug because I made it and I <laughs> sneakily inserting myself into the exhibition. We were, uh, Lindsay is a, her, she is a professor the, at Emily Carr University of Art and Design and also a professional set decorator. And so she really wanted to come in in person and go out and do this, um, the seek out all of the works, the, all the pieces that were gonna recreate the kitchen herself. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, she could not. And so we had we were just like on <laughs> Radovan, the preparator was on um, Facebook's marketplace every day. And he'd send a photo be like, what do you think about this chair? Could it be this lamp? You know? And she'd be like, more retro. So we it was a really fun project to get to work through. What she did send was all of her own was copies of all of her own family photos and images, which along the back tell the story of the resilience of her own family through a couple of different timelines, including one about her uncle who um, had his name taken away from him as a young man and was given a white westernized name and his legal battle to reclaim it after becoming a professional boxer and then training to be a lawyer and then finally winning back the right to use his name so it's if you go in and you sort of look around there's a lot of different things that are happening that all speak to that longer history that we were discussing we were really really fortunate to get to work with um other members other Inuit members that were part of our team maybe I'll well, yeah, I'm going to leave it here for now, but this will make sense in a moment. In addition to the curatorial team, we also worked with several members of the Inuit Futures Network who were heavily involved in the development of this project as Ilinaktuit mentors and creators. Funded by a seven-year Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council partnership grant, Inuit Futures and Arts Leadership, the Pilamek Sarnik Project, has endeavored since 2018 to train and empower Inuit and emerging academics and arts professionals to become readers, researchers and leaders in the arts across Canada in order to shift the balance of representation within the arts and cultural sectors towards Inuit self-determination and creative intellectual sovereignty. We foreground mentorship in our practices, um, including, or we foreground mentorship in our practices. Many of our colleagues at institutions big and small across the continent, and for that matter, Indigenous peoples everywhere, engage in mentorship as a strategy for making space in institutions, bringing up and along future generations, supporting the creation of new knowledges and creative practices, and changing the discourse of institutions by prioritizing the voices, concerns, and decision-making authority of Indigenous peoples through the process of building capacity for our emerging colleagues. By supporting growth and development in new skills and competencies, we build capacity across communities and in the arts alike. Because the more space we as Indigenous people take up in institutions, the more visible and accessible these institutions will be to those they have historically excluded. It is for this reason I believe that so many of us who are among the first Indigenous peoples in our departments, organizations, and institutions invest so much time in helping others to break through into these institutions as well. And I do not want to say that there is only that this is only one path. This is this is a path <laughs> to uh, sovereignty and self determination, and, and not the only one. Curatorial mentorship practices are a transgressive and transformational Indigenous methodology that disrupts the overwhelming whiteness of institutions by bringing Indigenous peoples into spaces from which they have been historically excluded and supporting them to grow, develop, and be successful on their own terms rather than on the institutional institutions terms. Uh, you know what those terms are. This means uh, filling EDI quotas, equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, other minimal and surface level or soft inclusion um, forms. 
and uh, forms of engagement with Indigenous peoples. As Leanne Martin has argued, periodic or soft inclusion absolves the institution from a long-term commitment to a serious treatment of works by Native artists. This intermittent inclusion or tokenism almost always guarantees consistent exclusion and gives the impression that there is no problem of exclusion. In recent years, we have witnessed the slow change in Canadian galleries and museums to address these exclusionary policies and practices. First steps were taken towards exhibiting Indigenous arts and cultural history, employing curatorial strategies such as consultation, multivocality, and other forms of power sharing. Paralleling these developments, Indigenous curatorial roles within institutions have been slowly shifting from the mostly uh, contract, temporary kind of roles to more permanent positions. Yet in the Inuit specific context, there remains a significant gap between the strong representation of Inuit artworks in museums and galleries relative to the weak numbers of Inuit in a gentle positions in the arts. And this is changing. For decades, Inuit have made up the highest per capita population of artists across the country, and nearly all Southern Canadian museums, big and small, hold some form of Inuit art collection. If you go to a rural house museum in, um, you know, in Hamilton, or if you're like driving, you know, almost anywhere in the world, someone, I've, 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 I have yet to visit a museum or gallery anywhere in the world where they didn't at least have a couple of little ivories or something to show me. And yet, until recently, there have been almost no permanent full-time Inuit employees occupying these spaces and sharing decision-making authority over the display, collection, and discourse of Inuit art. And this is not wholesale. We've had actually had here in Ottawa a lot of people that have had periods of employment in the arts and a lot of institutions that have had people over time in various positions, particularly um, formerly INAC, currently CERNA, the Indigenous Arts Section has had a number of artists who were in curatorial roles over, uh, you know, over time. And uh, there's been lots of people and a lot of, a lot of Inuit curators who have been primarily artists, but who have curated shows, but there's not, there's been very little um, consistency and very little about an ongoing presence. This is a major issue requiring urgent redress. Seeing the, the many factors colliding to create barriers that prevent Inuit from taking on a gentle roles across the arts. The founders of the Inuit Futures in Arts Leadership Project designed an Inuit-led multi-year initiative to closely train and mentor numerous Inuit into leadership positions by foregrounding Pilamik Sarnik, uh, or the development of skills through effort, mentorship, practice, and observation. The Inuit Futures Project is steered by an all-Inuit team representing all regions of Inuit Nunanga. Together, we contribute expertise to this project in many aspects of the arts. This includes uh, on their on our left, uh, Takalik Partridge, Jessica Kotick, Alethea Arnakwak Beryl, uh, Jesse Tungalik, and Renalta Arluk. These are Inuit that represent all of the different regions, but also have a great diversity of practices, as you can see on the screen, um, including everything from museum studies and archival practice to theater directors, film and television production, uh, and arts administration. Um, Inuit Futures prioritizes the hiring, training, and enhancing capacity of the emerging Inuit arts leaders to engage the arts as knowledge producers and research creators by pairing Ilinaktuit, or learners, Inuit post-secondary students, with professionals at institutions across our partnership who can closely mentor and support mentees on focused and meaningful projects. We work with more than 20 partner organizations, big and small, across the North and South, as well as a couple in the U.S., uh, led by Inuit, other Indigenous, BIPOC, and Halana, a white settler, mentors in our network to match Ilinaktuit with projects that best suit their interests, career aspirations, and availability to mentor or be mentored in a given year. The location of the placement is, I think notably, always the decision of the student and not of the institution. Um, we do not function to fill gaps in institutions, but rather to provide the most meaningful opportunities on the students' terms while respecting our partners' institutional demands at any given time. For example, uh, large galleries with multiple departments may have ongoing open positions that could be filled at any time, whereas our northern institutional partners are often staffed by Indigenous people who fulfill multiple roles in their organizations and who contribute significant service to and within their communities. So we work closely with them to find the best times, the most opportune times for them to have a student come on and, and learn and train. In this way, one key aspect of our methodology has been to tailor the pairings of mentors and mentees in terms of capacities, opportunities, aspirations, and timing. 
This is a delicate process requiring flexibility and patience. It also requires that the larger civic, provincial, and national institutions we work with, which you know are largely Halana led, are willing to change and adapt to our way of working. It is a part of our methodology of mentorship to shift and reorient these institutions' typical recruiting strategies but to help serve Inuit emerging arts professionals instead of the other way around. Uh, Inuit post-secondary students who want to work in the arts are few and far between. This is a this is a sampling of our last year's cohort. We have, I think, six new Inuit across the country involved in this project as well. Um, and so the institutions need to understand that they need to be worthy of our placements and not the other way around. So we are very often interviewing the institution and the Ilinakti may never have contact with the institution until we've vetted them to make sure that they are a site worthy of our students' time. We, myself and the project coordinator, Danielle Miles, check in frequently with all Ilinakti and mentors early in the project and throughout, especially as individual projects require additional support for various aspects of the projects. We have had very few students withdraw, delay, or pause their projects, but when they do have to do that for a variety of reasons, both before and after the pandemic. Oh, I'm sorry, we're not after the pandemic, during the pandemic. <laughs> then we not let them know that they can always come back to us. They can switch roles. They can take a break if they need to. If there's something going on with their family, they can always come back. To further our goals, we have also created a vast peer and mentor network for the Ilinok Tweet, who are located across the country in both the North and South to connect to one another by fostering good spirits, being open, welcoming, and inclusive, according to Inuit Kayumi and Kanki. We found this approach to be a highly effective aspect of our methodology because most post-secondary institutions are located in Southern Canada and students often feel very isolated in our big institutions. You know, how many Inuit students are at any university at a given time? We have numerous instances of Ilinoctuit not having any peers at all at their college or university. So to address this, we ensure they become an active part of our community of other Inuit as well and get them interested in working in the arts. We use our virtual spaces, as well, hopefully less and less as we go forward. And uh, annual gatherings, we have one coming up that we're really excited about. We're actually bringing everyone to Kamayok um, and try to make sure that that's the way that we're supporting well being across the partnership. Um, this is Jessica Winters, who was then an undergraduate student, is now going on to do a, she was just, uh, I think she was just accepted to Emily Carr. Sorry if that's not accurate, Jessica. <laughs> that's what we last said. And she curated the first solo show of Billy Goche in Nunatsiavut at the Rooms Provincial Art Gallery. Um, on the top left, you can see we've got a panel of, in the center are the two, the first two Inuit editors from Inuit Art Quarterly who are on a panel at the Inuit Studies Conference talking about their work. And on the side there, you can see that's one of the opening ceremonies for another conference, as well as um, artists at an opening that they curated and installed, um, talking about their work there. We brought a group of, we brought the first cohort of Inuit future students to Venice when Asuma represented Canada at the Biennale. And so it's amazing to see them now uh, be a part of Inua and for those students to get to go back and experience what happened uh, earlier. And all of them contributed. We did a week of workshops and lectures and lots of events around the opening of the Biennale. And then all of the students um, put their reflections into a special issue of Inuit Art Quarterly. If anyone would like a, a copy of this issue, I have about 600 because we published them and then we were gonna bring them to conferences and then conferences were done. And so now they're now they're like two years out of date and sitting in my office, unfortunately. We have, uh, it's, a, it's a really beautiful and special, special issue that <laughs> these students produced together because they were uh, sketching, writing about their experiences, talking about art that was not Inuit art, but global art and getting to experience on a large scale what it is like to go to a big event like this. And several of the artists who were participating said, you know, I, I wonder if I could be here at some point in my life. And I think that's the, part, the point of this project is for um, Inuit to imagine themselves in spaces that have previously the doors been closed. Following the tenets of Inuit Kayimi and Kanki, that decision-making be done through consensus and leadership, the Inuit Leadership Group prioritizes serving the needs of our students and the broader Inuit arts community in all decisions related to the project. We participate in the development of talents of the students through hands-on learning, and our large network of mentors, partners, and creators, artists and residents like uh, artist, Jess, artist Jesse Tunglick, work together to bring the students in on their projects and to involve them in a hands-on creation of art. Uh, Jesse was our first Inuit Futures artist in residence. At that time, he conceptualized the sealskin spacesuit. 
We brought a cohort of students on a special tour at the Canadian Space Agency, thanks to um, my colleague at the university who works in aerospace engineering. Uh, and then we brought in a number of uh, SAGEP students as well as seamstresses to prototype and make the sealskin spacesuit. And now it is one of the main commissions of Inua. So it's like, it's pretty amazing to see it all um, come full circle in such a way. As these post-secondary students graduate, we witness the full realization of their projects as they take on leadership positions in the arts as editors, arts administrators, curators, filmmakers, educators, and more. Uh, as of the writing of this paper, 13 students have graduated and now work in the arts across the country at both indigenous and majority white institutions. Uh, graduates of our mentorship program now work in collections management, professional editing, publishing, architecture, curatorial practice, arts administration, community programming, libraries, illustration, and early childhood education. We've also produced three major annual projects, um, including the first ever all Inuit issue of Inuit Art Quarterly that I just showed you. Um, and also that was not only written by 12 members of Inuit Futures, but edited by two Inuit together for the first time, a historic first for the magazine. Uh, one of them is still a full-time uh, editor with the magazine. Uh, during the onset of the pandemic lockdowns in 2020, we created an online series of artist workshops that provided virtual space for others and many other opportunities across the Arctic, uh, which were reignited by our partnership with the Indigenous Screen Office in 2021. Um, so one of the major things, I'm going to bring it back around now and I'll put the two things together and it all makes sense, is that we had during the pandemic, uh, like I said, we'd planned to take the students to two major conferences. We were going to go to NASA. We were going to go to NASA. It was going to be amazing. Not NASA, the space agency. NASA, this is a different space thing now. <laughs> Native American Art Studies Association. And um, instead, we had um, all those magazines, but also all that travel funding that we quickly pivoted into the creation of an online series. And then the second year, while we were still in the pandemic and we were working on the creation of Inua, we involved all of the Inuit students in the creation of an audio guide that goes along with the um, exhibition. So I will, I'm going to pull up the audio guide now, I believe. I think I have to, oh, that's Stanley in the background. And I can't see my cursor. Do you see me? Yeah. Where am I? <laughs> uh -oh. Help. I don't see it. Mm. Can I, if I just click on it, will anything happen? <laughs> I don't see it. To the right, this way? No? Oh, there it is. I see it. I see it. Yay. Okay. So let me make it big. I can't see it on my screen, obviously. There's a, a beautiful cat. This mobile work was created with the idea that it's not the spectator who walks around the sculpture, but vice versa. Matisse actually performed this piece at the Biennale, driving around the visitors. Hi, Nancy Saunders. Hi, my name is Nancy Saunders. I go by the uh, artist named Mia. The first time I worked with soapstone. I, I like the idea of trying to carve things that are intangible. The idea came to me where I, I want to see what it would look like if I tried carving throat singing. <laughs> Megan shows two aspects of the same important and fundamentally Inuk thing to do, sharing food. Mm -hmm. The harvest of the massive whale and the sharing of bite-sized pieces of muktuk is one and the same. A spirit is an intermediary between worlds. They alternate, connecting human and animal, the hunter and the hunted, what is seen and unseen. It's not always easy to get back home to visit, but when you do, you make the most of it. There you go, 
now. You know, it's where the sugar and the milk are. You just have to make it how you like it. Inuit stories often feature transformation, how humans could transform into animals and animals into humans, referring to a time when we were all the same, living together. After a day of playing in the snow, we would return home, walking through the door to the aroma of boiled carrots, potatoes, cabbage, and freshly caught fish. As long as the Inuvialuit exists, it is possible for the Anlapuk to return, to return to our way of life, to resume their role in our communities, to reclaim their place that was taken from them and from the Inuvialuit. And so we are waiting for the Anlapuk to return. Can I do it? Am I? Uh, but it's not on my screen anymore. Uh oh, <laughs> I can't see it. Here, here. Yeah. Here. Oh, okay. Uh, we're gonna leave it here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, this large-scale audio guide, Nagvaktivut, uh, what we found was co-created by the whole Inuit Futures Network to accompany the exhibition. Created in COVID-19 in isolation, this collaborative experimental audio guide brought together the Ilunaktui with mentors, alumni from our project, as well as co-curators and even some of the artists to virtually produce an all Inuit experience of the exhibition accessible in the gallery and online in English and Inuktut. The 55 entries offer diverse perspectives and reflections on the artworks in the exhibition from across the circumpolar world by the audio guide co-creators who created their individual entries at home in their own words and voices embedded in evocative soundscapes created in the North. And by at home, I mean, we meant, we, we thought maybe <laughs> in the lull, we thought, oh, great, we'll get to go into studios. You're all at universities, we'll do professional sound recording. And then we were no longer in the lull. <laughs> and so everyone had to make, uh, we had, we brought on sound advisors to help us make studios in people's homes. They were sitting under blankets in their closets, like <laughs> trying to get a good sound from sound kits that we sent out to people, whether they were in the North or South. So like major kudos to all of the Ilanoctuit and team, as well as everyone that we had in post-production. The reflections, reactions, and responses to the artworks take a variety of forms from poems to art historical engagements, personal recollections, and humorous anecdotes. Through Nagvaktivut, we were able to co-author the creative and critical discourse around the exhibition, sharing curatorial authority and voice with more Inuit than I believe have ever collaborated on a single exhibition project before. Emerging from the larger mentorship initiative, the audio guide underscores the significance of building and maintaining a network of peers. We relied not only on our hired post-production specialists to advise us on how to record and document our work from home when we could not visit those professional recording studios, which is yet another pivot. I know you all love the word pivot uh, during COVID-19, but, uh, but also on one another with a peer-to-peer -peer structure to support and encourage the creation and finalization of the project. We got together over uh, Zoom on multiple times and co-wrote and shared and workshopped our writing together as we move towards the finalization of the project. As Bronson said, each person who contributed to this audio guide has something valuable to share with you, something that will give you a deeper understanding of the artwork you are viewing and the environments that helped create it. And I, I think that is really true. I think that it speaks to when we were trying to do a really diverse project to keep including more and more Inuit voices in that project, I think is really just a part of the integrity of Inuwa. Um, I'm going to end with a quote from my one of my co-curators, again, Kablutsiak. Um, they say, I want Inuit to know that we can change the outdated definition, <laughs> that we can change the outdated definition of what Inuit art is. We are more than what outsiders define us as. It is crucial that Inuit artists, curators, filmmakers, writers, researchers, academics, aunties and uncles share and create new paths for future ancestors to be able to step into their own power. Inuit have been making art since day one. It was and is woven into everything we do and everything we make, both past and present. Art making is inextricably intertwined with culture and finding your way back to culture, expressing our love for our culture, sharing our culture, and redefining our culture. Nakami.
Katie. That's a light. I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we're going to have the Q&A now. We have about 15 minutes, but Heather is brilliant. So we have a little bit more in addition to just generally being brilliant. Yeah, you did. A you first. know, we started a little bit late. So uh, Marianne, do you want to come up and join us? That would be great. Marianne and I are going to take Can you hear me? the Q&A. Yes. Um, so there is, because we're still at a pandemic, which is fabulous. Not really. There's a mic there. We're not going to pass it around. Um, so please don't be discouraged by the long walk in front of everybody to the microphone, but do have your questions ready for Heather. Alternatively, you, if you shout really loud, that might work. We could repeat it if they shout it. We, uh, we yeah. could do that as well. And uh, for those of you online, uh, as we said, if, uh, questions can be, can be posted on chat uh, in French or English. And we'll start with that. So who wants to start with the questions? I have a ton, but you know. This was uncomfortable before the pandemic too. <laughs> so <it's... laughs> okay, I'll start. Um, I really like the way that you, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the way that you sort of sketch out this very uh, complex um, inter-institutional community, uh, full spectrum level of engagement that's required and tied to the exhibition and tied to the things that we do um, across all our different disciplines and with our different priorities. One of the things that I kept thinking about um, was if you wanted to talk about very quickly perhaps or not, it's up to you. Um, how did you, specifically for the way, how did you prepare the institution for the dynamism of Inuit methodologies, implementation of aesthetics and values that were potentially gonna be different from the settler colonial institutional perspectives? Oh, thanks, that is a good question. Yeah. Uh, did I make an effort to prepare the institution <laughs> for what was coming? I, uh, I think that we, we just, you know, what prepared the institution for the exhibition was the fact that all of the members of Inua were then added to the Indigenous Advisory Circle, which was formed in 2017, years before the institution opened in 2021. And so we had a four year leg up on an Indigenous advisory, which as, as you may know, uh, those of you in the room or those um, listening from home, it's advisory councils are usually formed in reaction to some kind of a crisis, <laughs> some sort of misstep by the institution and not in advance to prevent, to prevent those missteps. And so I think it was actually really critical that we were all um, in those spaces with the director, with various staff members, um, what, like when we were talking about their particular roles like education or communications or what have you, uh, but mostly with the director, Stephen Boris, who came and sat with us for often three full days at a time and would listen. And uh, I think that anyone, any museum director, that is an unusual role to be in, to show up at the meeting and then, you know, they're not, we weren't as bored, you know, and he would still come and stay for the whole thing and step out to take a call, but like not, but to be present and to be really listening. And I think that that was where the conditions were created for us to create this exhibition because we had buy-in from the very top of the institution. And if you don't have that, it makes things incredibly difficult. And if you do have it, everyone else kind of falls into line. And as you know, that's, that is, that is, the, uh, that is the, the biggest key is making sure that the, the, top, the top of the hierarchy, because they are hierarchies, um, is on board with and supporting your work. And that's not to say that we got along perfectly and everything went great. I had to, you know, I had to make the case for things when they were not the way that things were typically done or that there was something that was unusual about the process or something that uh, was maybe based in a relational aesthetic or a uh, way of being. But, you know, we, we didn't, there weren't any, there weren't any fights and there wasn't anything that uh, we couldn't talk our way into getting what we wanted, basically. And I think that that really is a credit to uh, how the WAG has been trying to change as an institution overall. No questions from Zoom <laughs> No questions from Zoom. Question, sure. Okay. Um, I was wondering, uh, the space in the exhibition is very open. And I recognize that that's probably largely due to the architecture. And I'm assuming that there were a series of decisions there. But um, 
can you speak about that decision at all? And then there's like little cabins throughout. And I was wondering what you wanted the experience to be as people walk around. Uh, that's another great question. So the, the building is the vision of, of Michael Maltzen, who is an architect based in architecture firm as well, based in LA. And um, he had a trip into the into the Arctic with some of the senior leadership at the WAG, including uh, curators and the director, and got to meet a lot of artists and see what the landscape was like. And he came back and sort of famously changed all of his original plans and did something new. And so he was working already with the existing building, which is kind of like a big inverted triangle. And so he had to put something on that top space. I mean, we could flip back to the architectural plans, but um, what he did, I think, <laughs> when, I, when, you, when you're actually inside the space, it's not cold, it's, it's quite, it's, it's a warm space, which I think is a little bit surprising. And, um, but it is quite large. And I, for me, I think of it as being kind of cloud-like, like it, it does feel really airy and open. I don't know that I would want to have to curate every single show in that space. <laughs> it's like, at some point they are gonna have to put up some walls and like, figure out something uh, to divide it up because you can't just do shows that are the sides of hockey arenas all the time. So I, I imagine that that's a puzzle for people who do have to work there, but that's not me. <laughs> Hi, Jocelyn, if you're listening. <laughs> But I, I think that uh, I think that's a great question because it is it is a question always of like you know you build this uh, beautiful building but then people have to work inside of it and and make sense of how that's going to function in the future. But I think that it's open to a lot of possibility. They did this really brilliant thing with the walls. They did um, they didn't. It's not drywall. It's actually a couple of coats, uh, a couple of layers of thin plywood so that you can always sort of drill into it and like like architecturally I was very impressed by the decisions that they were making that would make for really interesting installation uh, possibilities in the future and that right. won't lead to like crumbling walls so there's some really cool stuff yeah absolutely absolutely I have a question from the audience um, and then we'll and then Stephen Inglis also has a question. Uh, Gohande Horn Miller, Dr. Gohande Horn Miller from Carleton University, texted me the question. <laughs> um, thank God for technologies. Um, would you mind explaining the consensual decision making process that you engaged in with the co curators? Sure. Um, so we decided we decided together on what our process would be, which was the first start, um, and then like how we would make that work. At first, we thought, oh, we're not going to get to see each other very much, and then we didn't realize we would not get to see each other at all. Full <laughs> stop. Um, so our timeline actually got a little bit more expansive, but we did have our first couple of meetings together um, in in Winnipeg at the art gallery before the building had even broken ground. And uh, one of the processes we decided was that we were going to all um, come with ideas for artists and or specific artworks around the big broad themes. And those themes were anyway, moving forward together. We did have the title at first, but we had the idea of like a, where are we trying to go with this? And as my co-curator Asiniak said in a quote, I believe I had on the screen, what else do we wanna leave in the past? You know, like where are we trying to go, but also what are we trying to move forward on and what are we willing to let go of so that we can move forward in a really good way. And so like sharing those histories of colonization and, and then in, in, um, in their essay, they say, you know, wanting to think about like for the next generation, we hope that for you, you get to leave some of these things behind and that the weight of colonialism will be lighter on your shoulders. And so uh, we had big themes around futurity, around Inuit collectivity, around consensus, around community. And then we all went away and thought of, you know, 30 or 40 artists and artworks that we thought would sort of encapsulate that. And we thought about, as I said, uh, you know, wanting to bring in elders and youth and uh, diverse sexuality and gender representation and different media and like try to surprise people and think about who the commissions could be. And then to make sure that that was equitable across all the different regions of the Arctic, because I think we all know that some parts of the Arctic have had lots and lots of uh, historical attention and support through the arts industry and then other areas have not, mostly the central parts and then us on the sort of east and west have had less. And so trying to make that really um, fair as well. And then we got together and sort of did presentations for each other. And everyone was like, oh my God, I love that person. You know? <laughs> and, then like, and then, or you'd say, I've never, I've never seen that artist before because we're all from different regions and have different interests. And so it was in that way that we started to kind of um, come down towards a working list of artworks. And then it was a matter of, of looking and seeing you know, what's in the collections and what can we borrow? There's the first piece that we wanted from Jesse Kleeman was this, uh, I cannot recall the words for them, but you know, the really beautiful 
beaded yokes that uh, women in Greenland wear. And Jesse Kleeman made a piece and it's a yoke and it's like seven feet tall and it goes right down to the floor. And I want it so bad, but the museum said, well, it's just way too fragile for us to ship. And I'm like, you can't, you know, you lose a thread and then everything, and then you got a bucket of beads and not like an incredible piece. So we, uh, there were a couple of things that we really, really wanted that we could not get. Uh, another work that we were very upset that we didn't get in the show is that there was a Siberian Yupik artist whose work uh, was made out of natural materials and there was a lot of back and forth about whether or not we could get it over the border and they dropped out in frustration and protest and that and then we thought like will we put an empty plinth and like make a statement but then the artist was like I'm out actually so we did not have um, full Inuit Nunat representation as we'd hoped but I think that's a future show probably not going to happen right away but you know like sometime in the future hopefully and then there's a lot of there's a bunch of Ooh, now we got lots well Stephen well, had his hand up yeah. that i could see <laughs> heather uh, thank you for you know explaining all the different roles structures that you and your colleagues put together to make this beautiful exhibit i'm just wondering how much thought has gone into the structure of the organization By structure, do you mean like bricks and mortar or structure like the way the organization is working? Yeah, it is a great question. So um, the circle recommended two hires to the institution, which they made with the support of the Canada Council for the Arts. And that was for Jocelyn's position, which was three years, and then the WAG turned it into a full-time permanent position. Uh, they are planning on adding another full-time permanent Inuit curator. You can't have only one Inuk in the Inuit Arts Center. You know, they have educators and others on board, but you need other sort of senior leadership. And then the other position was Julia Lafreniere's um, Director of Indigenous Initiatives, it might be manager, I might be quoting her title wrong and I apologize, Julia. Um, but that is the important part there is that it's a, it's a management level indigenous person who gets their own budget, who is deciding uh, you know, how we're bringing people from the community. And she is local and non-Inuit. She's a, a Métis woman. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and so Julia um, has really strong connections to um, the broader community, as well as especially to elders and knowledge keepers and people who can bring ceremony into the space through all of the different indigenous peoples of Manitoba. And that was really critical to the work of the circle was to involve everyone in the creation of this space and to say we are making more space in the institution overall for all indigenous peoples, particularly Treaty One, First Nations, peoples of Manitoba and the Métis Nation, but then to also uh, make sure that Inuit felt like they were being welcomed into that space by, uh, I don't know if you watched the opening ceremonies, I believe they're still online, but there were days of ceremony with elders from each of the regions that really welcomed the space. They did the biggest smudge I've ever seen. It filled the whole building, the bowl, the smudge bowl, <laughs> usually this big, was like a salad bowl <laughs> used to like a sheet to waft it through the building it was amazing everything smelled so good uh someone said they could smell it like blocks away <laughs> afterwards uh but there was like but there was appropriate ceremonies for each region to the places so building in the two full-time permanent positions was really crucial to creating the structure but then also we advised on policy including hiring policies um training of staff and, uh, and then the naming, um, which I didn't get into just for time, but we, the Indigenous Advisory Circle, um, worked together with other, with all, uh, another sort of representative group of Indigenous peoples from across Inuit Unanga, as well as throughout Manitoba, in order to name each of the spaces, not just with Inuit names, but to also name the existing building, Benawin. Bayasea, I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, as well as other sites between this piece of the, naming the bridging between the two institutions with a Machif name, giving them names from Dene and other First Nations throughout Manitoba, so that people in the institution would be constantly reminded that they are on Indigenous land and that there are lots of people who are represented in that collection. They are also making a commitment towards not just um, 
maintaining a, a more contemporary presence for the Inuit art collection, but also to purchase more works from indigenous arts. So it's, uh, you know, it's moving at the pace of an institution. I think we're doing, they're doing uh, pretty good for how we have been so far, but I think that it, you're right. It does, a lot of it right now has to do with the fact that the senior leadership is really on board. And so we were very conscious of how, when a new director comes onto an institution, all of that can change if they have different priorities or different things that they want to highlight. And so trying to get some policies and some people in place, uh, some some roles that would be there, whether the person changed the role or not, that was really critical. Thanks for your question. We have a few questions from Zoom. I'm gonna start with this one. I'm asking if we can ask about your trip to Venice and what was your experience in representing Canada to a certain degree? Yeah. Um, so I didn't represent Canada. <laughs> I, was, I was there to, to go to garden parties and uh, organize some lectures. Uh, Afinac was on the curatorial team for the Venice Biennale and brought uh, was a part of bringing Asuma to the Biennale. And I think it was really incredible that we brought all the Inuit future students. I want to give a shout out to uh, the National Gallery of Canada for ensuring that we had passes. And if anyone here has ever tried to go to Venice, you know how coveted and hard to get your hands on those passes are. And the NGC ensured that we had passes for every single one of those students so that we could have a strong Inuit presence on site on the day of, and you know, to see all these young people show up in their Amati um, and uh, you know, have Inuit faces on site on an international BNL was a really amazing, uh, wonderful event. You know, we got to go to the uh, to the Canadian parties together, and we got invited to other things. The Sami presidents came and gave a guest lecture to us during our workshop series. It was an incredible time, and uh, just amazing to walk around with all of these young people, many of whom are artists themselves. So I'm a, I'm a curator, so I was like trying to pull them out of the arts and into like, curatorial <laughs> practice with you know varying degrees yeah. of success <laughs> and uh and so just to see them walk around and, and get to see what art installation on that scale could look like and to be in spaces that you know if you're from a small community you might not even have a cultural center if there's you know like you might just have a community center or a town hall and so getting to see them experience what that's like on a big scale was really fun and then also for them to you know meet some of their celebrity famous favorite artists was also just, you know, really sweet. Thank you. I have to put on my moderator hat. Uh, we've gone a little bit over. I think we have time for one more question and it, and maybe we can go from the chat. Uh, very quickly, we're gonna do another, there's another piece to this puzzle tonight and then we'll wrap it up. So uh, I'll hand this back to Marianne for one more question from the Zoom land. Wonderful. All right. Um, so this one, pardon me if my formulation is weird because it's a very long paragraph praising you. Um, but then, so they, they talk about how they enjoy your mentorship um, and they're asking. Um, is it someone from the project? It's Laura. Laura. Oh, Schneider. Okay. <laughs> Laura's not a student. No. Oh, okay. She's a lovely person and a director. Of an Fantastic. Hi, Laura. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, Laura says, if I understand correctly, the Inuit Futures Project has a seven-year scope. Do you have plans to continue this important work past this timeline and how? Also, P.S., how are your dogs? <laughs> uh, the dogs are okay. Uh, Vienna's, Vienna's gone blind. It's like, it's a whole thing. See, it's, it's, you shouldn't have asked, Laura. <laughs> Nitsa is fine. <laughs> It's a kid cancer and she's fully recovered. So that's very exciting. Uh, so that's the dog part covered off. The second part was what's going to happen to Inuit Futures after the seven year timeline. Um, so it is a seven year project with a sort of hard stop, but it'll be seven or eight years at the most. But we have a lot of partners on the grant who have benefited greatly from this project, who have been contributing a lot to it. And so we do have plans in the works to uh, it might go in a couple of different streams, honestly. Like what I did find through this project was that the scale and the expense of some projects is vastly different than say, making feature films, or <laughs> like training people in studios. To, uh, television film costs so much more and requires a very different kind of a timeline than, um, than doing projects like in 10 hours a week, the way that uh, curatorial residencies and fellowships are typically done or over a summertime. Film really requires you to be on set for a short limited period of time, which does not actually usually um, complement uh, student schedules. 
And the other ask, the other thing that we found with this project is that, you know, it's SHRC funded. That's a, that is a post-secondary funding body. And so their funding has to go to students. And of course there are, there's only one university, brand new university in the Arctic. It's a Yukon college is now Yukon university. And uh, there's just a handful of colleges and college campuses throughout the North as well. So a lot of Inuit don't have access to education or they have to move South and be in like a difficult situation if they want to. And so uh, there's a lot more Inuit who could be training or being trained and mentored into positions in the arts if they didn't have that additional hoop to jump through that they had to be a post-secondary student. So our hope right now is that we can uh, take the film and television. And, and I mean, obviously uh, my colleague, Alina, Alethea Anakwak Barrel and her collaborators, Stacey Aglock and others, they are um, going like, like just off the charts, fireworks explosions, you'll be hearing about it all soon. <laughs> so, you know, the, the idea of them developing a training and mentoring program that could train people to be directors of photography and grips and editors and so on. That's, that's sort of one direction, I think. I think the other side uh, with the Inuit Art Foundation, Inuit Art Quarterly, they've been hugely successful in uh, increasing the numbers of writers and editors and uh, other kinds of content and arts administrative producers. So I think that will probably go in that direction in another way. And um, I think that uh, with the curatorial part, I'm hoping that the institutions, uh, much like we hope for the Canada Council's project, that the institutions are going to pick it up and then they will create their own project uh, fellowships for curators and arts administrators and others to be in those institutions. So I'm really hoping that we've created the capacity in some areas that by the time that this is done in another four years, um, that those people will be holding open the door for others and it will just kind of grow in that direction. That's a great question though. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Dog say hi. <laughs> so we're gonna wrap up the Q and A for now. Uh, thank you for your time. And um, I'm gonna go over to the other microphone because I can't multitask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone at home. Thank you, everyone. Nakami. Am I sitting for this part? I think I'll, I'll sit for a moment. <laughs> so, one more announcement, okay? And uh, I would like to invite uh, Leslie Lee and Robert of the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts and Kodian, who are the I almost forgot this part was happening. I was so <laughs> wrapped up in getting my presentation done. <laughs> I'll take that. This will be short. Uh, thank you. Um, so the RCA medal designed in 1962, I gotta put my glasses on, um, by Jamaican Canadian sculptor, Cleve Horn, is given for outstanding achievement to Canadian culture, including for advocacy, curation, as a builder, or even for philanthropic activities. We're very pleased to present, following our wonderful Shirley Thompson Memorial Lecture, the RCA medal to Dr. Heather Iglo-Biorte, who with Dr. Ruth Phillips were our 2021 laureates. Uh, due to COVID, our November 27th ceremony was virtual, so it's wonderful to be offered tonight's opportunity to give Heather her medal in person. And um, so thank you for that invitation. And my colleague, Leslie Reed, this is the medal. Uh, my, my colleague, Leslie Reed, uh, nominated Heather, and she has a few words. Well, I have to say it was certainly a great pleasure to nominate Heather for this award for the RCA with the unanimous support of the Governing Council. They're all thrilled to, uh, to give you this, this medal. And uh, now you've just heard why we would do that. And, <laughs> and who could resist? <laughs> you walked into a room and had something to say. We'd all you know, be very, very attentive. But in all the years I've known Heather, I've admired her innovative and tireless work you can see how tireless it is for large projects as we've just seen, but especially for her support and mentoring of others, in particularly rising young Indigenous curators, artists, and scholars. As I saw in this, in two uh, very recent exhibitions, one in the touring exhibition Among All Our Tundras, which was, uh, I think, went across Canada to the Esker and what have you. And, uh, 
And more recently, the installation of Labrador photographers at the Bonavista, Bonavista Biennale. And uh, that was one of the highlights of the Biennale. Her ideas, beliefs, care, and energy radiate in multiple directions, touching so many young lives and a few older ones too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Heather. I'm wondering if somebody has an iPhone, they could take a photo because we, our, our press budget's top. top <laughs> I'll do it, I'll do it. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't get to have the medal to take home. Yeah, I, I don't know that I knew it was a real physical medal. <laughs> Made by a sculptor. It's 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 incredible. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. If anyone's still watching at home, <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> thank you all for coming out and being here in person. There's a lot of people here for, you know, still being in a pandemic. It's great. <laughs> I think we're coming out of it. Yeah, thank you. I do. I do. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, uh, Heather. It's amazing. I really appreciate it. It's just, it's lovely to see you. It's You're nice. like, actually, too. <laughs> Congratulations. It's lovely to see all of you. Thank you again for coming out. Um, we uh, would like to thank our partners, Carleton University, Ottawa Art Gallery, as well as um, the Rost, Councillor Ralston King for coming out. Uh, the city is here, yay. And uh, um, I am also going to thank our funders, Canada Council for the Arts, Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Ottawa. So come on back. March 22nd at 2 p.m. for Don Kwan's new exhibition and a discursive panel, but also don't forget to pop back for Dark Ice curated by Rebecca Bassiano and look for the moderated discussion with Leslie Reed and Robert Kautuk. Kautuk. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.